then Akari asks, why can Maki pass through the barriers? And Momo's like, because she turned into a monster. And then we see Maki make her triumphant return, slaying some curse and having like this unhinged smile on her face, you know, showing us how she's, you know, altered coming out of that arc, not only on the power scale, but personality wise as well. And she just looks awesome here. I'm a big fan of the new Maki. She's definitely one of my favorite characters. And this look on her face might be, you know, subtly letting us know that eventually this might turn sinister and she might have a heel turn. Same thing with Megumi. Like the two Zenins that are left might, you know, become heels by the end of the story. I don't want to go too much into it now, but, but hopefully I can make a video about that theory eventually. But I also love Maki's dynamic in the Cullen game and just in this arc in general, because, you know, she is so powerful now. She's like the new Toji, but also she's not bound by the Cullen game. Like she kind of breaks it because as we saw, she can pass in and out of the colonies because she doesn't have any cursed energy, but also like the main penalty of it, which is like cursed technique removal, which results in death. Like if you don't have any points in like 19 days or something like that, that's not going to apply to her because you know, no cursed energy, no cursed technique. So she could just do whatever she wants essentially. And on top of that, she's just a savage beast now with like awesome cursed tools. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how she just breaks this game essentially. Also her right eye is back. She basically lost it in the fight against her dad in chapter 148. So I guess since then off panel, she's somehow got it back either going through Shoko, you know, her using reverse curse technique, or she met up with a Kotsu and he did the same, or there's a third option, or uh, this is like a continuity error by Gege. Not saying it is, but you know, sometimes mangas do that. But we also see that she's with Nortoshi, another character we haven't seen in a while, and he has a complete aesthetic change here. Looks way more contemporary, and I'm a fan of this, opposed to his, you know, previous traditional Japanese look. And they're bonding here, you know, showing that they're, you know, pretty relatable, both having, you know, major aesthetic changes, but also kind of being like the black sheep of their big clans that they come from. Maki, obviously more so, but Norotoshi has it to some extent, enough to relate to her. And he says to Maki, you know, once you leave the barrier and join Yui Yui, please jump to the next colony. And then Maki says, that person helped me out with some personal business too, but are you sure? Everyone knows the siblings are calculating. So the personal business, I guess it has something to do with her slaying the entire Zenin clan. Maybe they pulled some strings and made it seem less egregious to everyone else or something like that. I don't know, we'll see what happens. But then suddenly like, they're alerted by something and we see the Kogane announcing that a new player is entering the game and it's like this worm-like cursed spirit and he talks just like a human. So considering that, along with him getting the attention of Maki and Nortoshi, or I'm assuming he's getting their attention. This is probably a special grade and probably a pretty powerful one too. And since there's so much emphasis being placed on him, it's possible he might be pretty significant too. I mean, I'm assuming that if he is alerting them here, he's going to be their opponent just to reestablish to us how powerful Maki is and also to show us, you know, Norotoshi's uh, fighting prowess. All right, so this chapter starting off with an update on the politics involving the Jujutsu higher-ups, something that we haven't really got an update on in a while, I guess. And the majority of this sequence is revolving around what we had found out at the end of the Shibuya arc, which I guess happened in like chapter 137 when the announcement was made that Gojo had been deemed an accomplice in the Shibuya incident and thus is permanently exiled from the Jujutsu world and that removing his seal will be considered a criminal act. Masamichi shall receive the death penalty for inciting Gojo and unfortunately we found out that uh, you know Kakuganji was the one that killed him and then also the suspension of Yuji's death sentences is revoked and the execution is to be carried out immediately and uh, Okotsu is the one to do that. And also let me point out that this is a flashback by the way to November 3rd a couple days after the Shibuya incident and in light of all of those developments Noritoshi Kamo from Kyoto High shows up to the Kamo main house and he's essentially looking for Gakuganji because he's going to try to convince him to convince the other higher-ups or the conservatives that you know all of that is BS and that Geto aka Kenjaku is actually the uh, the bad guy behind all of this stuff so can we just get a, a rule reversal and all that stuff please but unfortunately it doesn't really work out for him because he finds out in this sequence that Kenjaku himself has taken over the Kamo clan because when Noritoshi busts in there he sees Kenjaku and he's like, Ghetto. And then Kenjaku says, I'm done with that name. You learned my true identity in Shibuya. And like, 
technically he did, but also at the same time he didn't because he didn't like say like, hey, I'm Kenjaku by the way, guys. We, the audience, didn't even find that out until Tengen told the main group, which Noritoshi wasn't part of. So I don't know what he's expecting him to think here other than like, I'm not ghetto, but I'm like a brain thing. And even if he's expecting him to assume that he was the original Noritoshi combo, still, that's not who he is anyway. Hey, also guys, if you like my Jujutsu Kaisen content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just need a reminder, here you go, thanks. But then he goes on to say that due to Jujutsu terrorism, the sealing of Gojo, and the culling game, you thought that if the main culprit, although dead, is someone from the Kamo clan, maybe the conservative faction central to Jujutsu headquarters had already become puppets. But going further, he says, but I look like Ghetto, and there was an order for my execution. So maybe the conservatives were divided, and only some were responsible for the corruption. Bakuganji is trustworthy and has influence with the conservatives, so you wanted to plead with him to retract the notice from the headquarters. This goes back to what I said in the beginning, because in the first panel, we see him calling out for Bakuganji. He's trying to convince him that, like, all of that is BS. And this is also Gage, I guess, telling us that all of the Jutsu higher-ups weren't corrupted or inherently bad people they could be reasoned with in theory. But unfortunately, that's not even really an option anymore because Kenjaku has uh, implied to have killed them here because Noritoshi's like, you have already removed them from the party, responsible for recommending Suguru Gedo's execution. And then Kenjaku says, as well as the one who named Okotsu as Yuji's executioner. And then Noritoshi's like, he has already found and crushed every hope I had. So yeah, at this point, there's pretty much no way to overturn the ruling that was made on Gojo and Yuji. And also, it's establishing that Kenjaku's pretty much pulling the strings on all of the jujitsu higher-ups at this point. I think this is fine, and this is a good way of Gege like consolidating the lingering storylines here and having them all come into one so that they can all ultimately wrap up at the same time. But then we get this hilarious little sequence at the end here where Kenjaku's like, you have no place here, so we will never meet again. And then Noritoshi gets into like a fighting pose and activates like blood manipulation. And then Kenjaku starts laughing and he's like, no, not like that. Noritoshi Noritoshi's like, you didn't intend to kill me? And Kajaku's like, no, because even if you're alive, nothing will change. And I don't want to mess this place up either. So go get lost somewhere else, okay? So <laughs> this is awesome. And it really makes me like Kenjaku, like when you're not supposed to, because he's like, you're not even worth killing. And having to clean up the mess that I would make with you is more of a hassle anyway. And then we cut to the present time and we're seeing Noritoshi and Maki. And I guess this is ultimately what led to Noritoshi's big appearance change. But anyway, now we're coming off at the end of the previous chapter where Maki and Noritoshi were encountered by this huge worm curse. And Noritoshi is kind of confused as to what it is exactly. He's like, that's a curse, right? And Maki's like, I can understand Noritoshi's confusion. It's a cursed spirit, but I've got a weird feeling. And this thing just starts jetting around. And this is pretty awesome paneling from Gege here. This is like a great way of showing how fast this thing is. Like this is one of the better battle manga sequences I've read in the last couple weeks for sure. And it's just a, a simple display of speed. But anyway, he winds up tackling Maki into a wall. She tries throwing a punch at it, but it's so fast that it just easily diverts it and winds up hitting her into a wall again. And she's like, it's fast, but I sense something more. And then we come to the end of the chapter and through one of the holes on its head, a face forms together and it turns out that it's Naoya Zenin. And that's where the chapter ends. So yeah, Naoya is back and it turns out that the whole theory that we had about him returning as a vengeful cursed spirit was definitely true. And I talked about this last year when Naoya died in uh, chapter 152. And I did say that there was a chance that it wouldn't happen because it wasn't explicitly made clear. It was kind of Gege showing us without telling us, but I'm glad that it did play out that way because it left us wondering what if, and you know, we had time to forget about Naoya. So let me explain how this happened. So first of all, in chapter 33, it's Noritoshi Kamo himself actually, that basically says that if a sorcerer is killed without using jujitsu, basically like through traditional means, then they will come back as a curse. And that brings us to the death of Naoya. So after Naoya had fought Maki, after she had slaughtered most of the Zenin clan, she beat him down so bad where he was basically like crawling away and he couldn't even use like cursed energy anymore. 
anymore. And as he was crawling away, he encountered Maki's mom, who also had her throat recently slid by Maki. I know, Maki is a savage beast at this point. And Maki's mom, seeing Naolia crawling away, you know, with his life, literally stabs him in the back with like a regular kitchen knife. And no jujitsu involved in that. So that's like the big no-no. And because of that, Naolia has now returned as a cursed spirit, or more so, I guess, a vengeful cursed spirit. And as for how he he's moving so incredibly fast here, well, I'm assuming it's because he still has his curse technique, which is projection sorcery. Long story short, users of projection sorcery can basically divide one second into 24 frames. And they basically do this by seeing like frames of animation in their field of view. And they'll basically decide that they want to do something that is going to take up 24 frames. So in this instance, Naoya is just simply darting forward or darting off of the building in the direction of Maki or whatever. And if they do that as they foresaw it, then it will happen in one second. So that's why we see him moving so incredibly fast. Because it's also stated in chapter 151 that maintaining the curse technique, projection sorcery, allows speed to continually build. And that doing this, Naoya had already surpassed subsonic speed. So I guess he's doing the same thing here, if not even more, because I'm assuming he's become much more powerful coming back as a curse at this point, since he's giving Maki a way more competitive fight than he originally did. But also there's another aspect to projection sorcery and it's the penalty to it. So if they break the foretold 24 frames of movement, like if they do something that goes out of what they originally planned to do, then they'll freeze in like a literal frame of animation for one second. Now that doesn't typically happen to the user because they know how it works. But if they touch a person while they're in projection sorcery, then that person also has to abide by the 24 frames that they had already pre-planned. And since the person doesn't have insight into what they're doing, it almost always causes them to freeze in one frame. That's why we see that happen. Now, he hasn't done this to Maki in this chapter, but I'm assuming it's inevitable probably going to happen in the next chapter too. But another interesting thing here is that now his face is just coming out of like one of the holes here and there's like multiple holes, which is interesting. I thought that if now his face was going to be revealed then this whole hollow mask thing would come off. So it's possible that there's more to this worm centipede caterpillar thing than uh, meets the eye. And if it's not that, then I just always assume there would be like a metamorphosis that will eventually happen with this. So this chapter pretty much opens up confirming to us how how Naoya has returned as a cursed spirit. Something that we've been speculating a lot about these last couple weeks. So it's nice for it to just, you know, fully be confirmed here. And we see this flashback of Gaku Ganji talking to Noritoshi, which I guess is happening like around like the midpoint of season one, something like that maybe. And he says, when finishing off a hostile sorcerer, you must remember. And then Noritoshi says, in order to prevent your adversary's transformation into a curse after death, you must kill them with jujitsu. So this is cool for a couple reasons. Like I said, confirm and everything, but also letting us know how Noritoshi came across this information in the first place, because I'm pretty sure he is the first character to reveal this bit of information to the audience. But yeah, that's pretty much how Naoya was able to return as a cursed spirit here, because he was a sorcerer who was killed without the use of jujitsu. And going further into that, we see Maki thinking that she's responsible for this, because she says, I don't have any cursed energy, so I killed him with my fist. I should have known this was going to happen. So not having any cursed cursed energy, of course, because she has heavenly restriction, which basically means that like her cursed energy goes to zero, but in return, she basically becomes like a superhuman. Same thing that Toji had. And her thinking that she had killed Naoya with fists goes back to when she originally defeated Naoya because she quite literally beat him down with her fists. And I guess this is letting us know how Naoya was able to get away after that, because afterwards we saw Naoya like crawling away and he was just so devastated by the beating that he couldn't even use cursed energy but i guess this just means that maki thought that she legitimately killed him hey also guys if you like my jujitsu kaisen content please subscribe if you haven't already it's fine if you don't want to but if you just need a reminder here you go but as Naoya was like crawling away after the fact, Maki's mom, who was also dying, found him and stabbed him in the back with like a regular kitchen knife. And since that wasn't jujitsu and now he's a sorcerer, we now see him returning as what is going to be known as a cursed wound, but still a cursed spirit. But Naoya winds up confirming that, yeah, it was pretty much her mom that did him in. And we see Noritoshi assisting Maki here by firing an arrow at Naoya. He's able to do this because of his blood 
manipulation curse technique. He's pretty much coating the tip of his arrows with blood, so therefore he's able to like manipulate the trajectory of them. And it just makes me glad that Norotoshi is back, and I like the way that Gege is utilizing him in this portion of the arc, because he is kind of important to the overall story. He is essentially going to be the successor to the Kamo clan, which is one of the big three clans, and they're going to be a large part of the story going further, especially since we are coming to the end of it. And I do think he was kind of an underutilized character that had a lot of potential, so I just hope Gege is going to capitalize on that at this point. But also at the same time, you know, he's making use of Maki as well, not having to put the audience through us seeing them individually go against like a boss battle, just, you know, bring them both together here. But after Norotoshi does that, now he is like, I hate that curse technique. And I guess he's saying this because when we, I guess, first saw Naoya fight, he went against Choso during the uh, Yuji extermination arc. And Choso wound up like cleanly defeating him using blood manipulation. But anyway, going further, Maki like continues to fight against Naoya here. And she winds up like cutting him through the midsection. And she's actually doing it with the sword that Mai had given her. I don't think this thing has a name yet, but Mai was able to make this using her construction curse technique. I think actually like she wound up giving her life in order to make this. But in doing so, she kind of killed two birds with one stone because she gave Maki this awesome weapon. But Mai dying was able to take whatever minuscule amount of cursed energy that was lingering in Maki. And that's how she was able to get, you know, full-blown heavenly restriction here. But after slicing open Naoya, he suddenly starts to like spit these like spindle-like things out of his back and they wind up converging into like a, almost like a ball of yarn. And this is when Maki pretty much confirms that he was in fact a cursed womb this whole time. And at this point, he's kind of metamorphosing. And as we'll see, this is kind of like the beginning of the stages of now. Oh yeah, I guess, because we first saw him as like a worm or a caterpillar or whatever. So eventually, I guess that means that he's going to become some kind of like butterfly or some kind of winged insect. But as he's metamorphosizing into this ball of yarn thing, Norotoshi pulls out like a full bag of blood and he just does like a massive piercing blood using this. And he's able to completely shoot through the ball of yarn. This sequence is awesome. Even if it doesn't really amount to anything, it's still really cool how Norotoshi is using utilizing his piercing blood at this point. I think this is like the thickest version of it that we've seen so far. But he winds up thinking that he exercised it by doing this, but of course we know that it's not going to be that easy. But Nortoshi says, if it was that fast as a cursed womb, how fast would the final form have? And then we see him become like this cocoon metapod type form. So Norotoshi saying, you know, how fast he was as a cursed womb. I originally thought that he was using projection sorcery but it hasn't been confirmed nor denied that he is in this chapter so there's still the possibility that he does still have that curse technique within him and i think it will be eventually revealed that he does but regardless he still was super fast like one of the fastest characters that we've seen actually but now that he's become like this cocoon slash metapod form along with nortoshi saying you know final form i think that's all but confirming that we will see some kind of butterfly you know wing insect final version of Naoya here like this definitely isn't like his final form at least in my opinion I think it would kind of be odd if it was but yeah even in this cocoon metapod form he's still incredibly fast uh, I guess faster than maybe he was as the worm form because he punches Nortoshi like instantly and sends him like flying through the forest like this is some serious damage here like I already assumed that Naoya was like special grade in his original cursed moon form Form, but now he's you know even stronger than that so he might possibly be one of the strongest curses we've ever seen in the series like if not rivaling the big four natural curses he might even be surpassing them at this point and if not in this form then he will once he eventually goes to his final form because this is like crazy damage here and Norotoshi is like semi grade one at this point I'm pretty sure so he may or may not be completely taken out by this blow that he's receiving here. I mean, this would be a lot for like even a special grade to take. I mean, I'm sure Maki can take damage like this. Like I said, Nortoshi, different than Maki, much weaker than her, at least durability wise for sure. So going into the next chapter, I think Maki's probably
probably going to have to take over, you know, full blown fighting duty here. And that will eventually lead to Naoya becoming like his final form, I guess. And that's going to be like the true test there, like the big, you know, boss battle that we've been waiting for Maki to have. I mean, they've, you know, for sure been having it now, but once Naoya reaches that point, it's going to be like, wow, can they actually win this? Because like I said, he's so powerful right now. I think he's going to, you know, in theory, become maybe the strongest curse that we've ever seen at that point. And if anybody can overcome that, I guess it would definitely be Maki, right? And, you know, the occasional assistance from Nortoshi, because I'm assuming that he'll be able to at least do that uh, eventually. So coming off of the previous chapter, we found out that Naoya was still just pretty much a curse wound. And as soon as he took damage, he metamorphosized into his demonic looking metapod, which is like his second form, I suppose, of potentially three. And this thing is ridiculously powerful. I mean, we already saw how powerful he was originally. And at the end of the previous chapter, he winds up hitting Noritoshi as if he was like all might or something. And that brings us to the beginning of this chapter where we see Noritoshi actually surviving it because it turns out that at the last second, he was able to throw up like a blood barrier. And he says, if I hadn't blocked with my blood, I'd have lost my head and arm. A momentary misstep could mean death. I need to raise my game. So yeah, Naoya is unbelievably powerful right now. Like even Noritoshi is admitting like, if he basically just gets hit cleanly once, he's pretty much gonna die. And I speculated in the previous review that Naoya might be one of, if not the strongest curses that we've seen so far. I mean, it's ultimately debatable if he's like as strong or stronger than the big four disaster curse. But as far as like speed and strength goes, I think he might be at the top right now. And I say that also because of how he's dealing with Maki at the moment, who has, you know, full-blown heavenly restriction. Hey, also guys, if you like my Jujutsu Kaisen content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just need a reminder, here you go. Thanks. But speaking of Maki, we see her intercept Naoya as he's trying to follow up on Noritoshi, and they wind up like clashing, I guess. But then Noritoshi Toshi wraps up Naoya in a crimson binding so that Maki can wind up getting a clean hit on him, but Naoya winds up spinning out of this. So not only is he super fast and super strong, but he also still has retained his, I guess, pretty high fight IQ. Then Naoya reveals to Noritoshi that like he is Naoya Zenin. And I guess this wasn't really made completely apparent to Noritoshi beforehand. I mean, obviously we, the audience and Maki knew. And Noritoshi says like he fell to a curse, but retains this much of his own ego. Okotsu's Rika is easier to understand. So that is pretty interesting. Also because I guess this is the first time that we've ever seen this happen, like real time in the series. Like a sorcerer getting killed without jujitsu and becoming a cursed spirit. We'd only heard about it before that. As were with Rika, of course, she was just like a regular human who was cursed by Okotsu upon her death. And Rika's intelligence seems to be very limited. She kind of speaks like a caveman, kind of acts like one do. As were with Naoya, he still pretty much has his full-blown personality and memories. Only he's like more of an unhinged version of himself, of course, because he's like a cursed spirit. But I think that this is probably going to come back into play later on. Like, I think it's being mentioned here for a reason. Then Maki reveals that he can, in fact, still use his curse technique, which is projection sorcery. And this is something that we had been speculating about the past couple weeks because it was never really confirmed nor denied if he was able to use it yet. I mean, we assumed that he could because of how fast he was moving initially, because we know that the fundamental that makes now be Toe and Naoya so fast was consecutively using projection sorcery. And speaking of that, we see Naoya use it in a very different way here because he starts freezing frames of air and he hits them and it causes like all of these explosions. So he's able to do this because of like the penalty aspect of projection sorcery. The user maps out like 24 frames of animation and then they move accordingly. But if they touch someone or something in this case and that does doesn't move at 24 frames per second like the user is, then they'll be frozen in a frame of animation. So we saw before that now Bito was able to like freeze water in his fight against Dagon. So it's understandable that you could freeze air too, I guess. Even though you're like always moving through it, I guess you just have to mentally make a note that like, hey, I'm touching air here. So then he winds up breaking away from Maki and Naoya so that he can get some space away from them because he's essentially trying to charge up at full speed so he could just hit them with one massive attack because Noritoshi says like he'll charge once he reaches top speed 
how fast is that? And Maki says, well, he was faster than Sound before, so... I mean, already as, like, a human, when he was originally fighting Maki, it had said that he surpassed subsonic speed. So, yeah, he's way faster now as a curse, but we'll see later on that he goes unbelievably fast. But speaking of his original fight with Maki, she remembers back to that moment because she says, yeah, if he's gonna come for us at the speed of sound, then we can prepare our attack and wait for him. It'll be like that one time. And that one time is in reference to chapter 151 when, like I said, she was fighting Naoya as a human. And basically, as Naoya was, like, consecutively using projection sorcery and becoming so fast that he was surpassing subsonic speed, Maki basically realized that, like, okay, I'm just gonna stand here and wait for him to crash into me, and then I'll be able to counterattack at that point. So she goes into, like, this sumo stance, and at the last second, Naoya realizes what she's doing, and he tries to spin around to her back, also trying to freeze her in a frame of animation, but Maki's perception at that point in time had become so high that she finally realized the secret to projection sorcery, and that he was moving 24 times in a second and once she was able to finally see that she turned around as he was coming behind her and landed her counter strike which basically ended the fight there but obviously things have changed since then since he's way stronger now as we've been talking about and Maki winds up throwing like these spike jacks things <laughs> I don't know they're like some kind of ninja things i don't know i guess this is just a deterrent for him coming forward but also i think these things may come back into play in the next chapter possibly because we don't really see anything come of them unless they explode as he's coming in but as he is coming in he's kind of like making these circles and it's revealed that his new cursed form here has like the principle of a jet engine built into it as to where like he could take in air and then eject it for increased propulsion essentially out of like his butt i guess but this is like why he's so insanely fast because it's not only just consecutively using projection sorcery but it's this jet engine thing as well and at the end of the chapter we see him coming in full force and he winds up actually hitting maki and it's revealed that he had reached mach 3 speed which is like a little over 2300 miles per hour so yeah just think about like a jet flying overhead it was pretty much like that and i'm I'm sure it has a similar amount of force hitting Maki here. And like I said before, she was perceptive and fast enough to be able to counter Naolia previously, but now it's just a completely different game and she just wasn't able to counter this and she takes it like on the chin. And I don't know if this has like completely defeated her or if she's KO'd here because her eyes are open, but they definitely don't have the same amount of life in them that they did have previously. But yeah, this really isn't looking good for Maki or Naruto she was clearly weaker than her but also i just finished reading all of bleach and this fight uh more so than the others i've been reading recently remind me of like a bleach fight because the antagonist has become so unbelievably powerful that it's gotten to the point of it's like oh well how is the protagonist supposed to win this so unless there's some kind of divine intervention here maki is going to have to pull something out of her butt i guess to win here or it's going to be revealed that there's still levels to the heavenly restriction game and that she hasn't fully unlocked all the power yet or something like that i mean also like i said in the beginning it's implied that there's like another form to naoya here so i'm really curious to see how this plays out coming off of the end of the previous chapter we saw naoya charge up for like this massive speed blitz attack where we saw him go as it stated literally mach 3 and he winds up ramming right into Maki. And that brings us to the beginning of this chapter here, where we're finding out that, uh, no, she's not dead. I mean, we assume that she wasn't because she was still kind of conscious at the end of the previous chapter, but she's still alive here, just taking some serious damage, of course, because you know, Naoya is incredibly powerful. But then Noritoshi comes back into the fight and fires off some blood arrows at Naoya. But then we also see him just fully utilizing like a mass of blood here. And Naoya's like, is that his blood? Expending so much should kill him. Does he keep blood packs with him but he's like ah i get it he could be circulating the blood he uses externally and bringing it back that way he won't die of blood loss so yeah noritoshi is utilizing blood manipulation to an extremely high level here similar to choso but also different and we'll get more into that but he's bringing out like uh, i don't know a gallon or more of his blood at this point and using it as like a variable weapon and in order to not die from blood loss of course it's like constantly going in and out of him like he's a 
recycling his own blood, which isn't very hygienic. And, uh, you know, this leads to a lot of issues for sure, but, you know, there's cursed energy mixed into this. So maybe that, you know, mitigates that. And also guys, if you like my Jujutsu Kaisen content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just need a reminder, here you go, thanks. But after Nortoshi gets back with Maki, he's like, we can't afford to lose you right now. I'll hold him off. You get outside the barrier. Maki's like, no, I I'm not leaving. You'll die if I do. And Nortoshi's like, the way things are going, we'll both die. I suspected you suffered internal damage. A brief rest won't be enough. And Maki's like, no, I'll be fine. Trust me, I'm not bluffing. I could heal my injuries. Give me five minutes. So that's super surprising because I guess we're learning another aspect of Heavenly Restriction here that we weren't privy to with Toji because as far as I remember, I actually just recently made a video about Toji versus Gojo and uh, he didn't heal or anything like that. I mean, I wish he did after taking Hollow Purple because, you know, I just want Toji to always be a part of the story, but that's neither here nor there, but we just didn't see Toji do anything like this or it just wasn't explained to us. But Maki being able to heal her internal damage here makes sense because Heavenly Restriction basically makes you like a superhuman. So, you know, you being super fast, super strong, it's understandable that you also have an accelerated healing ability as well. So what would take a normal person like weeks to heal, I guess she can heal in five minutes? And I guess this is going to be the out for Maki here, or at least the out for them ultimately being able to defeat Naoya. Once Maki is fresh again, she's just going to come in and take out Naoya at that point, or have a better chance of being able to do it. I don't think she's going to get some kind of like Saiyan Zenkai or something as to where she gets more powerful because she's healed, but it will be more so just her being fresh and not damaged, which is kind of like a power of, I guess at this point in the fight, like getting your second wind if anything. So the whole thing going forward is Noritoshi trying to stay alive for five minutes while fighting off Naoya so Maki can heal, recover, and then come back and finish the job. But anyway, Naoya returns and he winds up running into like a blood net from Noritoshi. Noritoshi says he's faster than anything, but in terms of toughness, he barely compares to that thing. And that thing, he's referring to Hanami here. Hanami who he had fought at the end of the Kyoto Goodwill arc. He curls up when hitting top speed, so his own speed won't destroy him, which increases his toughness. But due to a binding vow, he isn't that tough the rest of the time. So that's really interesting because we were actually talking about this in like the last two videos, basically comparing Naoya to the big four natural curses. And I guess this confirms that he's faster than all of them as you know, we assume, but his toughness isn't on the level of Hanami's. And what does toughness mean? Uh, I guess durability, maybe? physical strength as well because it says he curls up when hitting top speed so his own speed won't destroy him which increases his toughness and apparently there's like a binding vow that he put on himself as to where he can achieve that in exchange for not being that tough the rest of the time not really sure how Noritoshi knows this unless he's just making a full-blown assumption here that Gege is kind of just turning into legit exposition <laughs> but it's possible that once Naoya evolves to his final form which we assume that he will this is kind of just like his middle stage, maybe he'll just surpass that and he will be as tough as Hanami at that point, or maybe even tougher. But then Noritoshi says, and he reacts to the blood of blood manipulation users, which is poison to curse spirits. So that's super interesting and something that I guess we should have expected because as we saw, Choso's blood was poison to humans. So it's understandable that it would be the opposite for Noritoshi, who's just a full-blown human. And also funny enough, Naoya has been affected on both ends of the spectrum here because he was poisoned by Choso while being a human, and now he's being poisoned by Noritoshi as being a curse. Then Naoya just swats Noritoshi away and winds up capitalizing on him, but Noritoshi just grabs him and spits blood into his turbine. This is like an amazing move, and I love the way that Noritoshi is utilizing this here. To be honest, blood manipulation users in general should always be doing stuff like this if given the opportunity. I mean, they're not always going to be hit hard enough as to where they're coughing up blood, but you know what I mean. And then he calls Naoya's bluff and assuming that like he won't use like a big move because he'd be afraid of blood loss or something. But he's like, nah, I'm not afraid. I'm actually kind of ready to die. And he shoots a piercing blood at him point blank and it pierces him. Then we kind of go into this inner monologue with Noritoshi where he's like, what would mother say? Would she chide me for not becoming the clan head? I failed to create a place for her in the house. And then I guess we're seeing like a flashback here, but his present self observing it in the moment. And this is in reference to his mother being like a mistress. She's not like the proper wife or whatever, or just not the proper 
person that was supposed to give birth to Nortoshi because the proper woman didn't have the ability to give birth to someone with the blood manipulation technique, which is obviously like, you know, the make or break thing in these big jujitsu families. So his father had to go to his mistress, which is obviously someone who is going to be ostracized here, especially given like the circumstances of everything. So Nortoshi's big goal here was to ultimately become the leader of the Kamo clan so he could essentially protect her because otherwise she would just, like I said, be ostracized or scrutinized or just flat out exiled or just bad things in general happening to her because of the way that these big families work. I mean, we saw how Maki and Mai were treated, but as we saw a couple chapters back, Kenjaku has now become the leader of the Kamo clan, meaning that Noritoshi's whole big goal here has failed and he no longer is able to protect his mother. So he's just like, ah, you know what? I might as well just sacrifice myself in order to take out Naoya so that at least everyone else has a chance of overcoming Kenjaku ultimately because he's like, let my comrades burn away their lives upon my ashes, which is an awesome line. But he says this after getting blasted by Naoya again. And then he suddenly like starts to do this crazy thing where blood is like starting to come up from the ground. And I'm not really sure what he's about to do here. Maybe like maximum technique possibly, or maybe he's like going into domain expansion possibly. And to be honest, this did seem like major death flags for Kamo at this point. And I was kind of expecting him to die until we come to the end of the chapter here because these two random guys show up screaming sumo and katana and that's where the chapter ends so i have no idea who these guys are but it's possible that they are sorcerers from like the past but also we see like these markings on their face or at least i assume they're markings it could be taken as like they're crying but they're so similar and that i think they're actually markings or scars or something and it reminds me of like the way that we see the blood markings on blood manipulation users faces so it's possible that these could be like old Kamo clan members who are just coincidentally at the right place at the right time and they were also part of like Kenjaku's deals that he made and they're coming to maybe help Kamo or they're just I don't know all fighting at the same time possibly or it's possible that they're like current day Kamo members and they were just in the culling game because they just happened to be there in that colony maybe but regardless I think they are like Kamo clan members to some extent. But, you know, them making a deal with Kenjaku also makes sense because he was Noritoshi Kamo back in the day. So, so maybe that's when he made a deal with other Kamo clan members, possibly. I don't know. It really could be both at this point. But so coming off to of the end of the previous chapter, we saw Noritoshi taking on Naoya by himself, and we were getting a lot of death flags for Noritoshi here until in the final panel of the last chapter, these two random guys show up screaming, Sumo and Katana. And I speculated that maybe there are ancient sorcerers from the Kamo clan that have been reincarnated for the culling game here. And uh, I was definitely wrong, at least about the Kamo clan stuff. And coming into the beginning of this chapter, we're getting their backstories for the most part. So the guy with the mustache's name is Daido Hagane. And we see him running around like the Sakurajima colony looking for a katana. And he winds up having no luck finding one, at least not at that point. And we come to what's going on with the sumo guy. And his name is Roku Jushi Mio. And he's just going around asking like everyone he meets to have a sumo match with him. And of course, nobody wants to until he randomly hears like sumo playing on TV in this old lady's house and he busts in there and asks like where they are and finds out that they're in Tokyo. So then he decides to go to Tokyo, but he seems to have like Zoro's sense of direction and winds up going the wrong way. But it's good because that leads us to where we were at the end of the previous chapter with these two guys showing up coincidentally at the same time. So this means that they're not together and this is all just one big coincidence. Hey, also guys, if you like my Jujutsu Kaisen content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just need a reminder, here you go. Thanks. But we're coming back to Noritoshi taking on Naoya, but Maki suddenly comes back and chops off a piece of Naoya's arm. And Noritoshi's like, it hasn't even been three minutes. And she's like, oh, sorry, but I'm impatient. And Noritoshi's like, I should make Maki leave the barrier as soon as possible. It's obvious that she hasn't fully healed. So this is in reference to the previous chapter, because that's why Noritoshi was taking on Naoya by himself in the first place. Maki took some serious damage from Naoya after getting like hit by him at Mach 3 speed. And while they were having like a sidebar in the previous chapter, Noritoshi said, the way things are going, we'll both die. I suspect you've suffered internal damage. A brief rest won't be enough. And Maki's like, no, I'm fine. I'm not bluffing, trust me, but I need time. I can heal my injuries. Give me five minutes. And that revealed that I guess the heavenly restriction that Maki has not only gives her like superhuman speed and strength and reflex and 
all that stuff, but also super healing as well. So the plan was for Norotoshi to take on Naoya for at least five minutes while also staying alive so that she could heal. But as we see here, he couldn't even really last three minutes. But then Dido, the katana guy, comes into the picture. And for some reason, Maki's sword like leaves her hands and like travels to the hands of Dido. And then we get some exposition on Dido where it says he's a nameless reincarnated master swordsman without peer. He's an outlaw among players who can wield a blade but not cursed energy. It wasn't cursed energy that overwhelmed the other four. It was something that had surfaced when he acquired a katana. Sheer lethality. And then he does like this powerful slash at Naoya. And right here we can tell that, yeah, this guy is no joke. So this is like really interesting, right? Because we've never really seen a character like this yet. We only really kind of got introduced to like powerful non-cursed energy users with like Heavenly Restriction with Toji and Maki. But now it appears that this guy maybe has something similar to Heavenly Restriction, I guess. As to where I guess his power ex exclusively comes from him being able to use like a sword rather than just like full-blown heavenly restriction that makes you like a superhuman in exchange for not having any cursed energy even to the point of where like we'll find out that he can't even see curses but then he looks at Maki's sword and he says a demonic sword the katana chooses its wielder huh so I guess this is in reference to the sword like leaving Maki's hands and going into his hands and as, since he can't use cursed energy I don't think that's like his ability or something doing that it's it's kind of implying that the sword itself willingly went into his hand. And it's possible because of like how the sword was made maybe. In chapter 149 when Mai was like talking to Maki for the final time in like their own little domain or wherever they were, she said you probably already understand my curse technique. I can make anything big or complicated. I'm heavily injured from his cuts referring to Ogi, their father. And she says so once I make this I'll die. Exactly what happens and we see Maki wind up with this sword here. So maybe this has some kind of interesting ability to it possibly or maybe there's like an aspect of Maki in it and this sword has like a personality now possibly and it's going to Dido not necessarily because it's like choosing him as like its new owner but maybe to show Maki how to get better possibly because I think that's the other theme of this chapter aside from just pleasant coincidences it's like Maki's chapter to improve or the next two or three chapters will be that or the sword went to Dido simply because it knew that it would be able to kill Naoya, thus, you know, helping out Maki in the process, but I guess that achieves the same purpose as the former anyway. So Dido is like swinging at Naoya, and he has him on the ropes at this point, and he says to Maki, girl, there's something there, right? Some kind of Ayakashi, which is like some kind of water yokai or something. I guess this is just what they referred to curses as back in the day. It still remains to be seen exactly what time this guy comes from. Could be 400 years ago, could be a thousand years ago, and everywhere in between. But Maki's like, you can't see it? And he says, can I see it, you ask? No, but if I see everything else, then it's the same as if I am seeing it. So I guess this means that he's just such a master of the sword and his senses that it doesn't really matter if he can literally see Naoya or not. The fact that everything else is so amplified to him that he can still sense the presence of Naoya for the most part. Kind of like what was going on with Toji and Heavenly Restriction, but I guess different yet the same, which is also what's going on with Maki. And then he just straight up cuts Naoya Naoya in half like this is insane like this guy is ridiculously powerful like he would probably be considered special grade at this point right and Maki's like what was that my attacks didn't do that if I see everything else what is it that I'm not seeing what's the difference between me and that guy and we see reincarnated Toji because that's like the only context that she really has for him so I guess this is implying that Maki hasn't like completely unlock the full power of heavenly restriction yet which is something we've been talking about these last couple chapters because obviously maki still has a lot of growth left to her and while she did seem like completely overpowered coming out of you know destroying the zenin clan it still was only just the beginning for what she's ultimately going to attain here which i guess is just eventually surpassing toji and then in the final panels we see the sumo guy mio come behind maki and he seemingly activates a simple domain that is also like a sumo ring 
And that's where the chapter ends. So I guess this guy is going to like, you know, have a sumo match with Maki, which is understandable because we saw her use like a sumo move against Naoya in chapter 151. Although it wasn't successful, it still was Maki like showing that she's somewhat familiar with sumo. So what I'm thinking is going to happen here is this guy is going to help Maki get stronger, whether intentionally or unintentionally. It doesn't seem like this guy's like a full blown villain or heel, to be honest. It looks like he just wants a challenge. And I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, Maki winds up realizing what she needs to through this match. Not completely. I mean, obviously there's still some sword stuff left, but speaking of that, I guess Dido is going to continue to fight against Naalia, but I don't think he's going to kill him because this is like Maki's victory for sure, right? So she kind of needs to get that one. And like we've been talking about these last couple chapters as well, I think this is like now his middle stage. So he still has like his third and final big ultimate form that's going to have like wings or something maybe. And then at that point, maybe he kills Dido or something. And then on his deathbed, I don't know, he gives Maki the secret to going to the next level, or it's possible that she just realizes what needs to be done to get to that point through whatever transpires with Dido being defeated by now. Oh yeah, in combination with her taking on Mio here. But yeah, that's where I see this headed for the most part. And it just ultimately ends with full power Maki taking out full power Naoya. So at the end of the previous chapter, we saw that new sumo guy Mio come up behind Maki and activate like this simple domain that seemed to form like this sumo ring. And coming into the beginning of this chapter, we're getting an explanation as to what's happening here because it says Mio's domain only functions when he does sumo. It's a barrier for focused on one thing, a pure sumo bout. To avoid needing a binding vow for all things jujitsu related, both the challenger and the challenged must agree to a match to complete the domain. So this is really cool actually. I think this might be the first time we've seen this or something like this in the series. And I would like to see more abilities like this, things that go outside the realm of jujitsu and kind of force you to fight vanilla, I guess you could say. Because the implication here is that once this domain is formed, basically all jujitsu is nullified pretty much, right? But it's not completely broken because it says that both the challenger and the challenge must agree to the match to complete the domain. And that makes sense because we saw Mio in the previous chapter, like going around randomly challenging people to a sumo match and they all refused, of course, therefore he couldn't activate his domain. Hey, also guys, if you like my Jujutsu Kaisen content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just need a reminder, here you go. Thanks. But Maki, on the other hand, is accepting the challenge here. And after she does, we see like the domain like fully forms around them. And as this is happening, Noritoshi is like, what are you thinking? And Maki's like, I've been overthinking, so let me blow off some steam. Understandable because this is kind of just happening literally in the middle of what we've been following so far with Magi Noritoshi taking on Naoya in his curse form. But also that being said, it kind of confirms what we speculated about in the previous chapter. And it's that these two guys are just randomly showing up to essentially just give Maki her power up and the breakthrough that she needs to go to the next level. And I talked about this in my spoiler video for this chapter, but this really reminds me of like a bleach chapter more so than like the other jujutsu kaisen chapters because i'm sure you know a lot of us see at this point that the two big influences on gege for making this series are bleach and hunter hunter and in bleach there's a lot of instances where things like this happen where a character will like run into a problem with an opponent or they'll just reach like a plateau or something and then randomly somebody will just show up mid fight or mid conflict and then train said character and then give them the power up necessary so that they can go further into the heart and also, like I said before, I'm not saying it's bad or anything. It just, it is what it is. But anyway, once Maki goes inside of Mio's domain and they begin their sumo match, she says, what am I not seeing? And this is in reference to the previous chapter when we saw Dido, the swordsman guy, take Maki's sword and use it better than she could. And we also found out that Dido can't see cursed spirits, but still he was able to cut Naoya, something that Maki wasn't able to do. And she asked Dido, like, you can't see him? And he said, can I see it, you ask? No but if I see everything else, then it's the same as if I am seeing it. And then Maki was like blown away by this. She was like, what was that? My attacks didn't do that. If I see everything else, 
What is it I'm not seeing? And that's like the big aspect of this chapter more or less. Maki learning to see what she hasn't been able to before. Literally and metaphorically. But anyway, when their sumo match starts, Mio like immediately dips under Maki's advance here. And he winds up like throwing her to the side. And he's like, you got more than that, right? I knew right away you'd eat me up if I took you head on. So I guess this is Mio like acknowledging that yeah, Maki's a beast naturally because she has heavenly restriction, which I guess also is confirming that his domain doesn't nullify that. I mean, it's implied to nullify all other jujitsu, but as we know, heavenly restriction isn't necessarily a jujitsu. We don't fully understand what it is. It's more so related to like a binding vow or something like that. We still need a lot more information on this stuff. But regardless, Mio is still pretty strong in his own right. I mean, I guess he's not as strong as heavenly restriction, but still far stronger than a normal person. But then he says to Maki, so tell me what's wrong. Why can't you focus? What's on your mind? You don't know what that samurai meant, right? As for me, I know. Let's play sumo. That's the only way I know how to explain. And then we get this really cool sequence where they go through like this sumo exchange. And something really interesting here is that it actually plays out like frames in an animation. Like you could put it together and it'll play out accordingly. And Mio says, you become entangled, girl. Yourself, others, curses, basically people. But isn't sumo about grabbing? Grappling? Yes, in the ring, one person clashes with another in a tense back and forth. The wrestlers themselves, however, develop outside the ring. At the moment of impact, everything that led up to entering the ring flows into the combatants. It's like smelling light or seeing sound. You sense everything about your opponent and yourself. And then he says the samurai was basically talking about freedom, that she'll essentially have to experience it for herself. So that's the whole thing here is just freeing Maki's mind. Yeah, she did have a huge physical power up with heavenly restriction coming off of my sacrifice, but her physicality isn't the only thing required for her to become strong. Obviously, she needs to strengthen her mind as well. And in order to do that, she needs to free it. And by doing that, you can essentially like smell light and see sound and sense everything about your opponent and yourself. This is basically what Dido is already accomplished and how he is able to cut Naoya without literally seeing. And this is like a really simplified version of it. But yeah, Maki is just basically freeing her mind, something that she hasn't done up until this point. This is also kind of what we see Gojo go through in the hidden inventory arc. Like it essentially takes Toji like pushing him to the brink of death for Gojo to have the breakthrough and his enlightenment as to where his freedom was him fully understanding how cursed energy worked and allowed him to use reverse curse technique and all that stuff. He also was a little crazy in that moment too, but I think there's kind of parallels here with just freeing the mind, if anything. And then they go back and have another sumo match, but this time it appears that Maki uses Mio's leverage against him and he kind of just fumbles off to the side while in the final panel, we see like the domain breaking and her smiling for maybe the first time possibly other than like when we saw her as a kid or in that fantasy sequence with her and Mai but yeah it's a very sharp contrast to what we typically see of Maki she looks very different here and I guess this indicates that she has had the breakthrough that she's needed and she has finally freed her mind or just attained freedom which essentially boils down to her getting her new power up which is not just necessarily a physical one like what she got before, but like I said, it's the mental one. So now she can synergize that with the physicality and become even stronger as a result of that. And yeah, it only took one chapter, but it's fine. I mean, we don't need multiple chapters of Maki training in order to become mentally stronger, I guess. It is what it is. But going further after this point, I guess this is how Maki will ultimately defeat Naoya. We've also been talking about for a while is probably going to have another transformation. And even at that point, with him ostensibly being maybe the strongest curse we've ever seen in theory, Maki will still be strong enough to defeat him, I assume. At least with the help of Noritoshi. Or Daido and Mio. For some reason, I feel like these guys are going to die soon. I mean, I hope they don't because, you know, one of the recurring themes in the calling game so far is like each one of the main cast members like meet this new character and then they kind of just tag along with them. So I hope at least Daido or Mio lives. I can see Mio living more so than died. So the beginning of this chapter is picking up directly off of the ending of the previous, where we saw Maki successfully completing her sumo and perception training with Mio, I guess, inside of his domain, where I guess she unlocked the full capabilities of heavenly restriction and is now able to perceive and sense things the way that Dido the swordsman did. Where in the previous chapter, Mio put it as being able to like smell light or see sound. You essentially sense everything about your opponent and yourself. And afterwards, we see Maki coming out of the domain and 
and Kamo's like, she's totally changed. What could have happened inside that domain in such a short amount of time? And then we get more information on Mio's domain where it says, as a result of the binding vow being removed, time flows faster in Mio's barrier. The time it takes for over 1,000 bouts inside the domain is less than one minute outside the barrier. So yeah, I'm sure you thought this yourself, but this is pretty much just a miniature hyperbolic time chamber. And it's like, I get it. This is necessary. Uh, you know, we need to get to this point with Maki and we can't really waste too much time in the story, but also in our real life as well, like stretching this out multiple chapters. But anyway, Naoya like retracts himself and starts to do that move that we saw him do a couple chapters back where he gains distance and then like shoots himself like a bullet at Mach 3 speed essentially. But then we come to Naoya like darting all around, like smashing in and out of buildings trying to successfully take down Maki which he can't now and we pretty much expected this to happen because like it's been established Maki got her power up and she's you know I guess seemingly using the full capability of heavenly restriction which uh, later on in this chapter is going to be implied that she's pretty much on the same level as Toji at this point because she says everything around me will tell me how Naoya will move that person would have reached that height that person would have thrown a katana without hesitation that person would have been able to handle everything at that at high speed. It isn't enough to be like everyone else. Something only I can see, something only that person could see, that exists. And that person, of course, is Toji, because like she says, she's the only other person that pretty much has heavenly restriction like he did, or at least known. And we also don't know why they have heavenly restriction or fully what heavenly restriction is, but I assume eventually we'll probably get more insight into that. But Maki is so powerful now that she's breaking like one of the biggest battle manga rules, and it's that you can't die in midair but she's doing it because she dodges Naoya in midair she's just become so perceptive and aware of her surroundings as to where she could just do this now and she says the atmosphere around us may seem empty but differences in temperature and air density create scattered surfaces so she can see this and sense this now meaning that whatever Naoya does she's going to be aware of it before he's fully able to strike her she winds up just counter striking him like down into the pavement but it doesn't really affect him too much because it is just a standard punch and while it is like a superhuman punch he is a curse after all and you need jiu-jitsu to take him down ultimately so then mio comes in and like headbutts him and dido comes with a follow-up and just cuts him directly in half and then the final part of the combo here is just maki kicking him apart and then we get this nice little parallel panel of seeing like toji behind her this is essentially like what naoya is perceiving here in this moment finally realizing that she is the new toji which is something that he's kind of been in denial about because Naoya himself always wanted to be the new Toji, which is pretty interesting because the only thing that Naoya and Maki have in common is their admiration of Toji. And if it wasn't enough for Maki to just ultimately be stronger than Naoya, which that alone is enough to drive him crazy, but the fact that she's now become like the new version of his idol is like pushing him past the breaking point for sure. But anyway, coming into the end of the chapter here, after Naoya had been cut in half by Dido and kicked apart by Maki, suddenly humanoid Naoya comes out of the half of the body that had been cut. And he says, the one who stands with them is me. You know, referring to his admiration for Toji, of course. This goes back to what he originally said to Maki in, I think, chapter 150 or 151. So yeah, this is also something we've been speculating about for weeks now. We assume that Naoya would have a third and final form, which would likely return him to like a humanoid type state. But I also expected him to have wings here because, you know, he started off as like a worm. Then he kind of went into like the cocoon metapod form. I mean, he still might sprout wings if he does or doesn't it doesn't really matter i just think it's cool that he's finally back in like his humanoid form but this is like one of the most human-like curses that we've seen so far since like mojito and i keep saying curse because i assume that he still is here he has like white eyes so i guess that's going to be his main curse like trait here unless he's like fully been reincarnated which is possible, but I don't think we've ever seen anything like that happen in the series yet. So I guess we'll just have to wait for some good old Gege exposition in the next chapter, if we even get it. But I would say he's more so still a curse at this point, and this is just like his full true form. I wouldn't even be surprised if what they were facing was still like a variation of a curse womb or something. But then he activates his domain, something that we haven't seen before, obviously, not even from his dad now, Bito. So what could Projection Sorcery's domain expansion be? 
like. But well, aside from going into like crazy speculation, we could just assume at first, maybe it would just have like the auto hit feature of the domains as to where he doesn't really have to touch you anymore to make you trapped in a frame of animation. It kind of just happens as soon as you're in the domain. And that alone in itself is pretty broken. But I also speculated in my spoilers video for this chapter that maybe instead of just receiving the 24 frames of animation and you have to abide by it if he touches you or he himself also has to, he kind of just slices up reality into 24 frames so that everything in the vicinity is now a part of that. And he can just trap moments of reality in the frames instead of just an individual person or thing. But aside from that, I also expect him to be unbelievably powerful here because naturally that's the progression of things here we saw how powerful he was originally and then once he went to his metapod form now he's going to possibly be one of the strongest curses ever if not the strongest curse that we've seen so far if he is still a curse in fact which i assume he is and i really like to see how heavenly restriction does in a domain which i'm sure we all do but now that she's almost doubled in power here seemingly she is without a doubt one of the strongest characters right now and I think it's safe to say that she's probably stronger than Yuji and Megumi at this point. I mean, granted, they haven't had the training and the power-ups that she's had, and we haven't seen them in a long time, but right now, she seems to be stronger than them for sure. And as for Dino and Mio, I assume they're getting trapped in this domain as well. And unfortunately, I could totally see one of them dying here. Maybe Dido. I mean, I hope not, but... Man, it seems like at least one of them is probably going to be kicking the bucket here, but... So this is a really good chapter. This is like one of the best battle manga chapters I've read this year. I don't know if it's like a 10 out of 10, but it's definitely like a strong 9 for sure. But it opens up with us seeing Naoya's domain expansion, which is Time Cell Moon Palace. This is like the projection sorcery domain expansion. And I guess it works the way that we initially thought that it would. I mean, we had some grand expectations for it of course but it's pretty much just projection sorcery with guaranteed hits because we see like these film reels come out of nowhere and like hit Dido and Mio in the neck and as Naoya puts it here very cleanly anyone I touch has to move like me or they will freeze up for one second in this domain it seems the techniques target is even more precise it can even target individual cells if you try to move they might get out of whack and when they do like they just get hit in like their their cells apparently and they just start bleeding from like their pores or whatever but yeah instantly just like that Mio and Dido are severely wounded by just immediately entering this domain which is expected of course and this seems so much like a Final Fantasy boss battle because now he is kind of just floating there he even looks like a Final Fantasy boss at this point and the domain just kind of goes on autopilot and just messes you up as long as you're just in there like he doesn't really even have to do anything but as we're gonna find out that's going to be his ultimate downfall but then he starts asking like where's Maki and like assuming that she died because like he can't fully sense her I mean it was always difficult to sense her because she had no cursed energy but, but as he says he still should be able to locate her but that's not the case because as we're gonna find out she's not even in the domain right now but Dido goes to swing at Naoya and he just instantly takes his arm off with holding the sword but as soon as he loses it that's when we see Maki come into the domain grab the sword and stab Naoya right through the back and then we find out what's exactly going on with Maki in relation to the domain because it says like Toji Maki doesn't have any cursed energy so barrier techniques treat her as a building that's like a strange way of putting it but it just means that it's not going to include her essentially then going further it says Naoya must use an actual structure as the barriers exterior like Fushigoro did in Tokyo Colony number one but unless she consents he can't trap her inside the domain so this means that Maki with her heavenly restriction cannot be contained in a traditional domain like a complete domain the way that we normally see it construct itself in a sphere the only way for her to be included in a domain unless she straight up consents to be a part of it is for you to like manually construct it in a set structure the example that we get here is when Megumi was going against Reggie because we saw that he constructed Chimera Shadow Garden using the gymnasium that they were in so when that happens since it's incomplete you don't get the guaranteed hit like what we see with Naoya using earlier on but you do essentially get like a buffed up use of your curse technique and and a more variable and extended way to use
use it. As we saw what Megumi did against Reggie, like Reggie activated Hollow Wicker Basket, which protects you against guaranteed hits, but since the domain was incomplete, Megumi was just manually using his curse technique. Therefore, the Wicker Basket slash Simple Domain doesn't really matter because it doesn't stop curse techniques. But then we get like this inner sequence with Maki shaking hands with Mai, and she says, you understand me now, right? I even let a sweaty middle-aged guy squeeze me to show you an example. So you were able to break it, huh? So this is interesting. I guess this confirms that the sword itself is kind of sentient and it has like a part of Mai's soul or consciousness in it or whatever, because Mai constructed the sword using her curse technique at the cost of her life. And we saw that when Dido showed up, the sword like annually left Maki and went to Dido. So I guess this is confirming that like, yeah, it's because it's somewhat alive. But now we're getting the full explanation on what this sword is, something that we didn't get for a while. And it says the blade that Mai left was a replica of the cursed tool Split Soul Katana. So yeah, like when we first saw this, we drew comparisons to the sword that we saw Toji use when he initially was fighting against Gojo and Gedo. And yeah, it turns out that it's just a replica of that, but for good reason, because this thing can bypass the toughness of any substances to cut the soul. Like the same soul that Mahito was manipulating with his technique. However, exerting that power fully requires eyes that can observe even the souls of inorganic matter. So yeah, there was a stipulation of fully using this. You can't just pick it up and then start cutting souls with it. You need to be able to observe the souls first. And obviously Maki couldn't do that at first, but as we talked about, Dino and Mio showed up conveniently at the right time to give her the necessary nuanced training that she needed to fully utilize the cursed tool that she has here. Because as we saw in the previous previous chapter, once she finished the training, she now had a greater sense and perception of things to where like she could see the atmosphere and spot the differences in temperature and air density. But not only that, she can friggin observe your soul now. And with that, she's like, pretty much cutting Naoya's soul here, which is like, you know, getting down to like jujitsu string theory stuff. But Naoya's like, stupid trash, you couldn't even finish me in one blow, so you lose because you can no longer move in this domain. No matter how much time passes, you're still, and as he's turning around, she's just like, nah, that doesn't work on me. And she like cuts his head in half. And then the narrator says the domain's guaranteed hit couldn't recognize Maki because she has no cursed energy. So yeah, this goes back to what we were talking about. The only way for a domain main to affect somebody with heavenly restriction is for you to first of all construct it in a structure but also you have to manually use curse techniques against them because if you just let it go on autopilot and just expect the guaranteed hits to work it's not because the ai of it can't recognize maki because she has no cursed energy but i guess naoya is dead here because the domain explodes and then out of it comes mio and dido which is awesome because i wanted them both to live and it seems like they are here. I mean, Dido lost his arm, but I don't know, he could still at least use the sword with his right hand. I mean, maybe he won't be as efficient as he was, and I guess it's understandable this is kind of nerfing him a little bit, because maybe he was a little too strong. And then we come to the final panel, where it says a demonic fighter equal to Toji Zenin was fully realized. So yeah, that's it. This is like the final confirmation that we're getting that she is now equal to Toji, something we've been speculating about for weeks now, but this is like the confirmation, meaning that like the Toji that we saw fight against Gojo, she's on that level right now. And this means that she's easily like one of the strongest main characters right now. Like, I don't know if she's necessarily stronger than a Kotsu, like that would be a really good fight right now. But I think that she's probably stronger than Hikari and definitely stronger than Megumi and Yuchi at this point. Like she's probably in the same tier as a go-to possibly. But yeah, that's pretty much it for the chapter. And I'm assuming that now he is dead here because she freaking cut his soul and she like split his head. And unless he's going to stick around a little bit so that Noritoshi can get his hits in or whatever, because he still needs to do something, I guess. Right. But I don't know. I just assume that this is the end, but let me know what you think in the comments, guys. And if you liked the video, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.